Hi all. Here we are now for one of our last CHY 113 lectures. Believe it or not, we are almost there. Uh, we have this one last unit in which we're going to investigate properties of gases and what we call intermolecular forces. And we're only, we're only going to have about three lectures over this topic. And then we will be done all of our new material for the semester and start to focus in on our final exam, which will be here before you know it. And so that being said, let's go ahead and just dive in. And so in the beginning of this unit, we're going to focus in on properties of gases. And really the reason, one of the reasons that we have to do that is unlike solids and liquids, the properties of gases are very much affected by the environment that they're in. If we drastically change the temperature or pressure, that's not going to affect my water bottle. It's not going to affect something that, that's, a, that's a solid. However, really, really changing temperature and pressure can have a huge effect on maybe the gas that's in this room. And so we're going to look at, 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 the, at that type of those types of relationships and see how we can change the properties of gases by affecting various factors. So when we look at what we're going to be looking at in this topic, we're going to start out talking about gas pressure and various gas laws. We're going to then move on to looking at the, at the gas laws in the context of chemical reactions, look at gas mixtures. We'll talk about something called the kinetic the molecular theory of gases, which really gives rise to the discussion of all these properties we'll talk about. We'll look at diffusion and effusion of gases, which is really just the, the movement of gases, either in open air, so to speak, or across a membrane. And then we'll look at what we call non-ideal behavior of gases. For today's lecture, we're going to focus on the first three. We're going to look at, at pressure, gas laws, and what we finally call the ideal gas law. And so when we're talking about gases, it's, it's important to go back and, and note some of the different properties of, of the phase of a gas that we talked about in the beginning of the semester. For instance, gases can be compressed. And this is something that, that's vitally important to somebody like a scuba diver. Now, I forget the actual numbers involved here, but each time we breathe in, our lungs take in something like half a liter of air or so, something like that, a quarter a liter or a half a liter, somewhere around there. A scuba tank can only hold, and again, I forget the exact number, but something like five or 10 liters. And so it's pretty easy to see that under normal conditions, this, a tank isn't going to hold nearly enough air for a scuba diver to be able to go underwater for any appreciable length of time. What's important though, is that that air can be very much compressed. We can take what would normally take up, you know, a, a volume like this and really pack that down in. So it now takes up a very small volume. In that way, we're able to get enough air under, under high pressure into a scuba tank. And so the diver is unable to breathe it. That's what the regulator is for. The air that, that's in the tank is under an incredibly high pressure that regulator changes the pressure to something that the diver can actually breathe. Gases exert a pressure on whatever surrounds them. We'll be talking about pressure a lot in the upcoming lecture, so I'll save talking about that much for now. As we talked about way back in the beginning of the semester, gases always expand into whatever volume is available. Uh, and so in that way, <clears throat> gases will take the shape of whatever container that they're in. Gases completely mix with one another. And that's another key property. When I think about the air down here in my office, it's not like I can, I can point to one spot and say, oh, that spot of air is mostly hot, mostly oxygen. Oh, that spot over there, mostly carbon dioxide. Oh, mostly nitrogen down there. It's not like that. The, the gases completely, utterly interspersed and mix with each other. And when we look at some of this behavior sort of at the molecular level, you'll, you'll really see that and it'll start to make sense. The physical properties of a gas depend on four main factors. They're going to depend on the pressure of the gas, the temperature, the volume of the container, and N, which is the number of moles of the gas, the actual amount of the gas. So all these different properties that we talk about, or all properties of gases in general, are going to be dependent on those four things. You'll note that nowhere in there are we talking about the identity of the gas. And that's another important aspect, is that all of these different properties that we talk about, it doesn't matter what the gas is. 
these properties are going to depend on these four things, not the identity of the gas. It's also important for us to note that when we say something like oxygen is a gas, what we're really saying is that oxygen is a gas at normal pressure and temperature conditions. So atmospheric pressure and room temperature, for instance. And so what you think of as just the, the regular conditions in your room. And so anytime that, that we do say something like that, that we say such and such is a gas, that's what we really mean is that it is a gas at those conditions because we can mess with those conditions. And so if we take, for instance, something like carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide we know is a gas at, at normal conditions. I just breathed a bunch of it out. And it, it definitely came out as a gas because here in my office, I have a standard temperature and pressure. If I really, really, really reduce that temperature though, and then if I really, really, really increase the pressure, I can make carbon dioxide a solid. And, and, and that's dry ice. Dry ice is just solid carbon dioxide, solid CO2. And so those conditions, all the conditions in, in, in which we would have to have in order to have solid CO2, those are obviously not normal atmospheric conditions. And so that's just another thing that is important to keep in mind is that when we do say something is a gas, we're saying it's a gas at what we would consider to be normal pressure and temperature since then situations. So pressure in general is equal to the force divided by area. And so here we just have an example that we can see. This would be an example of, of a manometer, something that is going to measure pressure for us. And so here we can see a sample of mercury down here, which is what these first, uh, the, the first pressure sensors were made from atmospheric pressure pushing down on the sample of mercury. And so we have that force, that force of literally force of air pushing down on our mercury here, which in this case then causes the mercury to rise to varying levels. And that's how we would me measure the actual pressure of air using a system like this. But pressure in general, keep that in mind, is that it's always equal to the force divided by area probably one of the more common ones that, that you're familiar with, PSI. PSI is a measure of air pressure. And we typically think of PSI maybe within a tire. Pounds per square inch. Pounds being the force, square inch being the area. And so PSI is literally a measure of how many pounds is the air exerting per square inch of that tire on the inside. And so like I had mentioned, this um, had already really talked about this that in this type of, of pressure, pressure measuring tool, atmospheric pressure is going to push down. It's going to exert a force per square inch on our sample of mercury here, which will cause the mercury to then climb up the liquid in various, uh, to various levels. And so very, very common units of, of pressure one that we see quite often, or one that we, that we, that we, I shouldn't say quite often, used to see quite often because of, like I said, very, um, some of the very first barometers, which are specifically used to measure air pressure, worked with mercury, and you, you literally measured how far the mercury traveled up the tube. And so one of the first measurements of pressure in general was literally just millimeters mercury. We use um, units of atmospheres quite often. And so standard pressure at sea level is one atmosphere of pressure. And when we're thinking about air pressure, we're literally thinking about the air pushing down on us, how much air is up above us pushing down. And so we have a series of different conversion factors here. And so quite often, like I said, we, we, um, we think in terms of ATM, in terms of atmospheres. One of the reasons is that's just a convenient um, it's a convenient tool for us to use, or it's a convenient unit for us to use because we have a, a sense of it. I mean, we can think of how much air pressure we, we just sort of experience in, in everyday life, and that's one ATM. And so we, we, can, we can compare to that. We have a relationship to it. But then a series of, of different conversion factors, 760 millimeters mercury is equal to one ATM. 
Tor is another pressure unit. 760 Tor is also equal to one ATM. So you can see that one millimeter mercury is one Tor. We also think in terms of Pascals quite often or kilopascals. And so 101,325 Pascals is one ATM. And so if we convert that to KPA, that'd be 101.325 kilopascals, obviously equal to one ATM. Sometimes we think in terms of bars or millibars. We won't use that one that often here, but here's our conversion for that. And then finally, the pounds per square inch, the PSI that we talked about, 14, about 14.7 PSI or equal to one ATM. We're gonna to need to do conversions like this quite often, um, especially quite uh, maybe millimeters mercury to ATM. That might be one that we use fairly often. It's just a conversion factor, just like any other. And so if we're doing this conversion here, if we want to convert 610 millimeters mercury to ATMs, and I'll just writing it down so then I can bring up my screen here. And so again, it's just a conversion factor. And so we would start out with our 610 millimeters mercury, one ATM per 760 MMHG. And that would give us whatever that gives us. 610 divided by 760. Point eight zero ATMs. It's important to note when you're looking at sig figs as well, just to, to note this, that these are considered exact and so don't let these conversion factors factor into your significant figure determination. So when I was determining my sig figs for this answer here, I was going off my given information of 610, which had two significant figures. And so my answer has two significant figures. Conversion factors are typically always exact when it comes to sig figs. So that's a, that's a type of conversion that you will do quite often. Uh, and so you'll have to use some of those, those different conversion factors for different pressure units. Temperature is something else that we have to talk about when, and, and the units for temperature that we're going to use for anything concerning gas laws. So when we think about the various temperature scales, Fahrenheit is the one that, that, that we silly Americans are most used to. And if in Fahrenheit, the freezing point of water is 32 degrees Fahrenheit. The boiling point of water is 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And one, so one degree is equal to 180, 180th of the difference between the freezing point and the boiling point. Kind of silly. Then we also have Celsius. Starts to make, starts to, to make a little bit more sense. The freezing point of water is set at zero. Boiling point of water is set at 100. And therefore, one degree equals one one hundredth of the difference between freezing point and boiling point. But we still have that issue where sort of the set points and the, the degrees that we use are based upon the properties of a particular substance. And that, that can present some problems for us. And so anytime that we're working with the gas laws, we use what we call the absolute scale, which is the Kelvin scale. In the Kelvin scale, the zero point is the point where theoretically all molecular motion stops. And that's known as absolute zero. And so if we remember when we talked about um, phases and phases of, of um, sorry, phases of matter way back in the beginning of the semester, and we talked about the relationship between phases and molecular motion, and talked about how we have, we have in the gas phase, Particles are moving around, all around, completely independent of each other, bang off each other a little bit, but then keep going. We start to cool that down and the particles slow down and they start to now interact with each other. And there are forces that are now going to hold them together. And we're gonna talk about those forces in our third lecture in this unit, by the way. But now in the solid phase, the forces that are holding these together is not overcome by the motion of the particles because the motion of the particles has slowed down. In the solid phase, now the motion of the particles has slowed down even more. 
So they pretty much stay in place and there's maybe just a little bit of, of vibrational energy in there, but they're pretty much staying right in place. But, but that's an important note is that in a solid, they're still moving, they're still vibrating and still moving around. As we cool down even more and more, that vibration starts to slow down until we get to absolute zero. Now all motion completely stops. So that's the zero point in the Kelvin scale is that now we have, we have cooled things down to the point where all molecular motion simply ceases. Very, 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 very cold. And so the Kelvin scale, as I mentioned, it's an absolute scale. Zero is the uh, point at which all molecular motion stops. It's important to note that the Kelvin scale is not a degree scale. Temperatures are simply reported as the number Kelvin. And so for example, you would say 273 Kelvin. You would not say 273 degrees Kelvin. This is actually a pet peeve of mine. If I hear you say degrees Kelvin, I will come to your house and I will slap you in your face. Legal disclaimer, I will not actually come to your house and slap you in your face. Can't do that. But it'll bug me. I really I just I don't like hearing degrees Kelvin because it's 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 not a degree scale. And so to convert, to convert from um, sorry, from Celsius to Kelvin, add 273.15. That's all. It's a simple conversion. And so in order to convert from the from degrees Celsius to Kelvin, and we're not even going to worry about Fahrenheit to Celsius, by the way. Uh, I mean, there is a definite conversion to, to go between the two, but we're not going to worry about that. We'll typically be given temperatures in Celsius and have to convert those over to Kelvin to work with the calculations we're going to discuss. And so in order to do that, you just add 273.15. And so 25 degrees C, basic room temperature, add 273.15, we get 298.15 Kelvin. To convert from Kelvin to Celsius, we just subtract 273.15. That's it. When you are doing this though, make sure to be mindful of your significant digits. And so we are going to take the sig figs for, for Kelvin into consideration here. And so you'll note where we're actually going to cut those off. And so just be mindful of those. Uh, or, and, and be mindful of that when you are conducting your conversions. I can't stress this enough. Any calculations that we do with the gas laws in which we use temperature, you must, must, must convert to Kelvin. If you leave your temperature in degrees C, you will get it wrong. Temperatures must be in Kelvin for all gas law calculations. We also, it's also helpful for us to define a standard temperature and pressure when we're working with gases. It's sort of a, a standard set of conditions to be used for comparison. And so we call standard temperature and pressure, we say, we call that STP. And so at STP, we're at zero degrees Celsius or 273.15, but you'll see that we do quite often drop the 0.15 off there. Uh, and so 273 Kelvin, zero degrees C, standard temperature, standard pressure is one ATM or 760 torr. And so when we're talking about just sort of conditions in general, again, if we say STP, this is what we mean. At STP, we have a temperature of 273 Kelvin and a pressure of one ATM. When we get to, to talking about the gas laws in a few minutes, one of the ways that you'll use this quite a bit is you might say, for instance, you have a balloon at STP. You have, you have a, a balloon with a volume of five liters at STP. What is the new volume of the balloon on top of a mountain where the new pressure is 0.5 ATM and temperature of minus 20 degrees C? You would then have to go through the gas laws, which we're gonna talk about, uh, and then find the new volume but you're comparing those set of conditions. You're comparing the, the new temperature of what I say, minus 20 and the new pressure of, of um, 0.5 ATM to the standard temperature and pressure of zero degrees C and one ATM. 
So the gas laws, what we're gonna talk about are mathematical relationships now between pressure, volume, temperature, and the number of moles. Now, when I get into the gas laws, or when we start talking about gas laws, there's another very convenient way, I think, to think about pressure. One of the ways that, that helps to think about pressure. So yes, pressure is force per unit area, which is also sort of equivalent to if we have, let's say just this, a ball or a balloon filled up with gas, we can also think of that force per unit area as, so we have all of these, the gas particles in here. And so remember all the gas particles, all the, all the air particles are all moving around. They're all bouncing around in there. They're all moving. As they're doing so, they're going to be colliding with the side of the container pretty regularly. We're gonna have lots of these collisions with the inside of the balloon. And that, that's the pressure. That's, that's the, the air particles exerting that, that pressure, exerting that force on the inside of the container. And so as we go through talking about these gas laws, try to also think about pressure in this way. Think about pressure as the number of collisions on the inside of the container. Because if that number of collisions goes up, if there are more collisions, there's going to be more force there. If there are fewer collisions, there's going to be less force hitting the inside of the container. And so it, it definitely helps as we move on to think about pressure in those terms. Think about pressure as the number of collisions on the inside of the container. Because one of the other nice things about the gas laws is if you think about them from that perspective, these gas laws just make sense. They make intuitive sense. If you just think about what is going on and what effects some of these changes we'll talk about will have. So the first one that we're gonna talk about is Boyle's Law. Boyle was a scientist, you can see living here in the 1600s. And what Boyle figured out is, and, and we can see the, the um, sorry, the actual definition of it here, Oops. that the pressure of a system of, a, of gas particles is inversely proportional to the volume of a fixed number of moles at a constant temperature. What this means is that as long as the, we don't change the, the amount of the gas and as long as we don't change the temperature, this means that the pressure and volume of a gas are going to be inversely proportional. Now, again, let's think about that in the terms that we just talked about. And so if we have two different balloons here, they both have the same exact amount of gas, they both are at the same exact temperature. Which one of these then is going to have more collisions on the inside of the container? Again, same amount of gas, same temperature. So the, so the gas particles are all moving at the same speed in each of them. It's pretty easy to see. This one's going to have more collisions. And so the smaller volume is going to equal, can't spell this morning. Nope, afternoon now. So the smaller volume has more collisions and thus a higher pressure, leading us once again to be able to say that pressure is inversely proportional to volume. And we can see mathematically how that's working out here, but what that leads us to is the mathematical expression of Boyle's law of P1 V1 is going to be equal to P2 V2. And we'll see how we use that in just a minute. We can think of this in a good example of Boyle's law sort of in use is a bicycle pump. As you're, as you're pressing, as you're pumping up a bicycle tire, as the volume of air trapped in the pump is reduced, the pressure goes up. And so as I'm pushing down, the volume is actually being reduced. So you've got that piston. So here's the, the sort of the shaft of the, of, the, uh, of the tire pump. You have a piston in there, which is being pushed down. So as that piston moves down, the volume of, of space within that pump decreases 
When that happens, the pressure is going to go up and that forces the air to then go into the tire. Pretty, pretty effective. And so here we have Boyle's law written out, P1 V1 equals P2 V2. It's important for us, a couple things to note here is for one, like I said, the, the amount of, in order for Boyle's law to work, the amount and the temperature cannot change. And so we then have this mathematical relationship. It's also important to note that any pressure or volume units can be used as long as they're consistent on both sides. And so a very typical Boyle's law problem might be something like, um, well, in our, in our balloon example, if we, if we maybe come back to this. So you might have your balloon example here and we might have our first balloon here. We might say that the pressure in here is 1.2 ATM and this balloon has a volume of 5.0 liters. And then we would say over here, now we take that same balloon and we just compress it down. And so now V2, this balloon now has a volume of 2.5 liters. Oops. And we want to know what the new pressure is. And so we would simply use our P1V1 equals P2V2. We want to know P2. So P2 is going to equal P1, V1, all over V2, just a little algebra. And then we can just plug the numbers in. And that's Boyle's Law. I think we have a couple examples here, maybe. Or a couple applications of it, then some examples. So another great just application and way to think about, uh, about the effect of Boyle's Law. So back to scuba divers. When a diver goes really deep, more gases, and in this case, especially nitrogen, because that's the, the primary component of air, but more gases will dissolve into their bloodstream. And this is a factor of another law, which we won't talk about that much, but Henry's law states that the solubility of gases increases with increased pressure. And so when a diver starts to go deeper and, and their, their body is under more pressure, more gases can dissolve into their blood. So now we have a diver that started out at the surface. Now they're down, who knows how far down, but they're down quite a bit, down quite a ways. And so more of the, more air, more gases are, is, are dissolving into their blood. If they come up slowly, then that, that's fine. The gases will, will just slowly diffuse back out of their blood and they'll be fine. If they come up too fast, however, then what's going to happen? So now they're coming up very, very fast. We think about Boyle's law. So now these gases are trapped in their blood. They come up very quickly. So they're going from a high pressure situation to a low pressure situation. And so the pressure is decreasing right, as they go from, from down deep to the surface, the pressure decreases, which means the volume is going to increase. So now they're popping up to the surface incredibly quickly. And so what happens is that that pressure suddenly goes down, meaning the volume of that trap, that extra trapped gas in their blood skyrockets. And so that extra trapped gas in their blood is now expanding and creating huge problems, which we know as the bends. Very painful, life-threatening situation. That's why um, one of the things that you see on like Navy ships, for instance, where they might have a lot of divers, they have pressurization chambers where if this happens, if there's some huge emergency where a diver has to surface incredibly quickly, if they're able to get them into a pressurization chamber very, very quickly and rack up the, the pressure on them again, then they'll be fine. The gases are in there and then they slowly change the pressure. They mimic the diver coming up slowly so that the gases have a chance to diffuse out. Incidentally, 
uh, of, of God, quite old movie now at this point, Cuba Gooding Jr. and Robert De Niro, Men of Honor, great movie about Navy divers um, before most of your times, but I'd highly recommend it. Uh, Cuba Gooding Jr. plays the first person to go through the master diver program in the Navy based on a true story, phenomenal movie. Uh, but there's one scene in there in which De Niro's character has to do what they call a fast dive. Uh, and, and he does that to try to, to save someone else. But what he does is basically dives down and then pops right back up almost immediately. And I like that scene because it's actually, I think, fairly scientifically accurate that he was able to do that because he went down and up so quickly that the, and so, and he didn't, get the bends because the gases hadn't had a chance to diffuse into his bloodstream. So he was able to avoid that situation. Uh, but under a normal situation, it's something that, that divers have to worry about. And there we go. So, okay, so here's an example. And so here are a calculation example. So we have, we have a sample of nitrogen gas at a pressure of 67.5 millimeters mercury. It's in a 500 milliliter flask. We want to know the pressure of this sample when it is then transferred to a 125 milliliter flask at the same temperature. And so a good approach, I think, to, to gas law problems in general is first write out your given information. Our initial pressure is 67.5 millimeters mercury. Our initial volume, our V1, is 500 milliliters. Our new volume, it's one, V2, is 125 milliliters. And we're looking for the new pressure. And so I, when I do these problems out on paper, I literally do this. You'll see me write P2 equals question mark. That's what I'm looking for. I recognize that this is a Boyle's law problem because I'm talking about pressure volume relationships. And so write out Boyle's law, write out the equation that you're going to use. We want to know P2. So the next thing that I would do is I would just algebraically manipulate this equation here and solve it for P2. And now I see that I have all the numbers that I need. So now I would put my numbers in. Unit wise, we can see that absolutely milliliters are going to cancel out for us, leaving us with units of millimeters mercury, which is good. That's a unit of pressure and we're looking for pressure in this problem. Then we can do the math and we find that the new pressure is 270 millimeters mercury. Another example for you to try. And so here we have a 500 milliliter plastic soda bottle emptied out and sealed in Peru at an altitude of 11,400 feet where the pressure is 475 torr. We then take the bottle to Portland where the pressure is 760 torr. We wanna know what the new volume is assuming there was no change in temperature. Let's go ahead and pause the video now, apply Boyle's law to this and see what you can find. As another just thing to think about, though, is that you'll, you'll see sometimes in gas law problems that there's information maybe in there that you actually don't need. For instance, in this one, it doesn't matter to us for the calculation that we're at an altitude of, of 11,400 feet. This isn't something we're going to use. This is just the, to illustrate that at higher elevations, we have lower air pressure. And so, like I said, pause the video, apply Boyle's Law, see what you can get. Hopefully you got 312.5 milliliters. The next gas law to talk about is Charles's law. And so whereas Boyle's talked about volume pressure relationships, Charles's law looks at the relationship between volume and temperature. And so again, let's actually, let, let's not even look at, at these calculations yet. Let's just think of our theoretical balloon. So we have two balloons that are the same size. So the, the same exact size balloons and they contain the same exact amount of air. This balloon here is at room temp at about 120, uh, sorry, at about 23 degrees C. This balloon here is at 100 degrees C. Same volume, same amount of, of air in there. But let's think about these collisions with the size of the container. So again, thinking about the fact that temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy of particles. So higher temperatures, particles are moving 
faster. And so the particles are literally moving faster in this balloon than they are in this one. So if they're moving faster, what is that going to do, do you think, to the number of collisions on the inside of the container? That's right. Increase. We're going to have more collisions with the side of the container in the hotter balloon. And so more collisions at the higher temp equals, sorry, I just realized that I was talking about the wrong law, um, that Charles's law discusses volume and temperature. Sorry, sorry, sorry. And I started to discuss uh, the Gay-Lussac law actually, which we will come back to. And so my apologies, let's go ahead and think about volume and temperature rather than pressure. So my apologies for that. And so let's say that I, again, let's say that I have a certain balloon, this is back up here. And so I have a certain balloon at a certain temperature. This balloon is at 23 degrees C. It has a certain pressure. Now, what I do is I decrease the size of the balloon. I compress my balloon a little bit. And so, Okay, sorry, I just had to pause the video there and, and, and collect myself. I was still just a little thrown from, from the mistake I, I had made. And so let's put that behind us. And so let's say that, that actually what I do is I decrease the temperature. So without thinking about the size of the balloon yet, I'm gonna decrease my temperature to zero degrees C. Okay, so we have this balloon at 23 degrees C. It has a certain, it has a certain volume. It has a certain pressure in there. Now Charles's law depends on the pressure and the amount of gas staying constant. So the pressure is going to stay the same. And so if we think about that, if our pressure is going to stay the same, that means the number of particle collisions has to remain the same. The number of collisions with the inside of the container has to remain the same but the particles are slowing down because we're going to a lower temperature. So the particles slow down. And so if the number of collisions though has to remain the same because my pressure stays the same, that means that my balloon has to get smaller. And so this means that volume is going to be directly proportional to temperature. So again, pressure stays the same, the amount of gas stays the same. And so if I decrease the temperature, the volume will also decrease and vice versa. If I was to heat the balloon up, if I was to go to 100 degrees C, my balloon would have to get a fair bit larger because the particles are now moving faster so to keep the number of collisions the same, I have to increase the area that they're hitting. And so Charles's law, the way that it would mathematically work out is V1 over T1 is going to equal V2 over T2. Now remember, as we talked about earlier, always, 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 always convert to Kelvin. Your answer will be wrong if you don't. You must convert to Kelvin. I don't know why I have weird effects with the things flying in like this, but again, here's our, our basic Charles's law equation. And if we look at an example of this, we can see this. If we, if we had a sample of liquid nitrogen, for instance, take a balloon and drop it into liquid nitrogen. If I have a balloon that's like this, I drop it into a vat of liquid nitrogen, the pressure in the balloon is going to stay the same. But the balloon is going to shrink right down. That volume is going to get a lot smaller. And so here's a good example. So your lungs have a volume of about five liters at five degrees C. We want to know what the volume is going to be at 11 degrees C. And so first of all, is the volume going to be larger or smaller? That's right. 
it will be larger. And so go ahead and see if you can do the calculation and choose between A or B. What do you think it's, it's going to be? And so pause the video now, apply Charles's law and see what you can get for an answer. Hopefully you got 5.1 liters. Another example here. And so we have a five milliliter sample of carbon dioxide. It's in a syringe at 22 degrees C. We then take the syringe and immerse it in an ice bath at zero degrees C. We wanna know what the new volume is, assuming that the pressure remains constant. So again, apply the same problem solving approach that we looked at with Boyle's law. Write down all of your given information, write down what it is that you're looking for, write down the equation you know that you're going to use. Now, what I always do here, when I write down my given information, if anytime that I'm working anything with the gas laws, I immediately convert to Kelvin. Then it's just done. Then I know I don't have to worry about it later. So next though, what we want to do is look at our or look at algebraically manipulating this equation. And so we're going to solve it for V2. Then we can plug our numbers in and we get an answer of 4.6 milliliters. Now go ahead and try this one. Go ahead and pause the video here and apply Charles's law and see if you can come up with the answer to this question. So pause the video now and see what you can do. Hopefully you got an answer of 15 milliliters, 15.0. Okay, one more. This one here, same, same type of problem. It's still a Charles's law problem. But now we want to come up with a temperature rather than a volume. Pause the video, see what you can come up with. Hopefully you came up with 278 Kelvin, which is equivalent to five degrees C. Now, if you didn't, if you ran into a problem here, check your algebra. A very, very common uh, error that I see in these problems is people performing incorrect algebra when they're trying to solve for something that's in the denominator. So let's work through this problem. So a syringe contains 150 milliliters of dry air. And so so V1, 150.0 milliliters, T1, 25 degrees C or 298 Kelvin, T2, or sorry, V2, 140 milliliters, and I'm trying to solve for T2. And so I set up my, my Charles's Law relationship. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. I'm trying to solve for T2. An incredibly common algebraic mistake that I see here is people simply saying, well, I've got to go ahead and divide both sides by V2. I've got that on, um, uh, that right now is sitting here, V2 divided by T2, so I've got to get rid of this. So I'm going to divide both sides by V2. And so people come up with V1 over T1 V2 equals T2. This I see very often. This is absolutely the incorrect algebra. Do not do that. T, if you do that, T2 is still in the denominator algebraically. And we can't have it down there. We have to get T2 up into the numerator. So keep that algebra in mind. What I would do here in order to get T2 out of the denominator, get it up top, cross multiply first. Just go ahead and get yourself to V1 T2 equals V2 times T1. All I've, all I've done is cross multiply, right? I've just cross multiplied my two terms. Think back to algebra. Now that I've cross multiplied, now I can solve for T2 and I get T2 equals T2, or sorry, V2 T1 all over V1. Now I can plug my numbers in and I'll come up with the right answer. So be careful of your algebra is really the moral of the story there. We could use Charles's law or we have used Charles's law 
to derive the actual number for absolute zero. And so if we think about Charles's law in general, if we think about that relationship, then theoretically as we, so well, we know with Charles's law that as we decrease temperature, we decrease volume. And so theoretically, there will be a point that we could decrease the temperature to the point where volume is zero. And so what we can do is we can actually set, and it's pretty easy to set up experiments where we have something, some sample of gas, and we decrease the temperature, or we increase it, we, we adjust it, we, we manipulate the temperature, and we record the new volume. And in doing so, we can plot that. We can plot what the volume is of this gas sample at various temperatures. So we can get this plot. We can then extrapolate this line down until it meets the x-axis because at that point, at this point on the x-axis, volume is zero. And so then whatever that temperature is there, that's absolute zero. Now we come to the Gay-Lussac law, which is one that I, like I said, I, I'd already started to talk about, uh, but the Gay-Lussac law, and I'm not gonna talk about it in, in much more detail here, uh, but the Gay-Lussac law tells us that pressure is directly proportional to temperature as long as the amount and sorry just noticing a typo which i'll go ahead and fix you get to watch me fix it there we go so the gay lussac law is telling us that at a a set volume and a fixed volume and a fixed amount the pressure and temperature are directly proportional. So again, as long as my volume stays the same, if I increase the temperature in a gas sample, the pressure is going to go up. And so we could, then that ends up looking very much like Charles's law, except for pressure instead of volume. And so what we can do now, now that we have these three different relationships, Boyle's, Charles, and the Gay-Lussac law, we can combine them all together into what we call the combined gas law. P1 V1 over T1 equals P2 V2 over T2. We can do this in order to investigate the effect of changing more than one variable. And so here we have a scuba tank that contains eight liters of air at 140 ATM and 20 degrees C. We want to know what the volume of that air is going to be at STP, at standard temperature and pressure. So again, let's take our problem solving approach. Write down all the information that we have. We know V1 is 8.0 liters. P1 is 140 ATM. We know T1, we convert that to Kelvin right away. Now for P2 and T2, we're at STP. So we're at 1 ATM and we're at 0 degrees C, which is equal to 273 Kelvin we're looking for V2. So here's our general equation for the combined gas law. We're gonna go ahead then and isolate that and algebraically solve for V2. And then we can just put our numbers in. And we get 1,043.5 liters or with correct significant figures, 1.0 times 10 to the third liters. In this case, and some of you might be looking at this scratching your head a little bit for the sig figs because of the one ATM and zero degrees C from our STP. STP is something else that's considered exact. And so if you're told STP, don't let that factor into your significant figure determination. I'm using the initial information I was given in the problem. And so I would use my 8.0 liters. That's the, the lowest number of sig figs or the 140 ATM, either of these have two sig figs, and so that's what I'm using for my significant figures. Now a question might be though, how many moles of gas are present? A couple ways that we can go about this. One of these is by using what we call the molar volume. At STP, sorry, the, the molar volume at STP, any gas one mole of any gas will take up 22.41 liters. So that's another important conversion factor to know. 
And so at STP now, we knew that we were at 1.0 times 10 to the third liters. Here's a conversion factor for us. One mole of a gas will take up 22.4 liters. This is again, what we call the molar volume. Any gas at STP, one mole of it takes up 22.4 liters. Here's just another question. So go ahead and, and I'm not gonna say anything else. Use the combined gas law, try to solve this problem. Hopefully you came up with 11 liters. Another sample problem here. See what you can do. So this is what I did. And so compare that to what you did. And if you weren't able to get the right answer, try to see where you went wrong. We also have Avogadro's law, which says that equal amounts of gases, an equal number of moles, occupy the same temperature, or uh, sorry, equal amounts of gas at the same temperature and pressure occupy an equal volume. And so really what this is getting at is it's just telling us that it doesn't matter what the gas is. Any two gases, if you have the same amount of the, of the gas at the same temperature and pressure, the volume will be the same. And so the volume is going to be directly proportional to the amount of the gas. And yeah, we're not gonna really look at calculations with that, but one of the things that this now leads us to is what we call the ideal gas law. PV equals NRT. The pressure times the volume equals the number of moles times R, which is the gas constant, this number right here, times our Kelvin temperature. A few things to just to, to know and um, to be aware of when you're using the ideal gas law. Again, always convert to Kelvin. You might be given grams. If you are given grams for your amount of the gas, you, might, you have to convert that to moles. So we know how to do that. And you'll also have to convert any of your units to make sure that your units are matching up with the, your units of R, which are typically going to be liters, ATMs, mole, and Kelvin. So again, if you're given temperature in something besides Kelvin, convert that to Kelvin. If you're given volume in something other than liters, convert that to liters. If you're given pressure in something other than ATM, convert it to ATM and so forth. And so what else did I wanna say there? Not much. Here's some different values of R. Typically, for our purposes, we're probably going to use this 0 0.08206 number. Uh, but different, uh, different values of R just use different units. Uh, but we're typically going to use this one. And so here's just an example here. So here we have a gas at a certain pressure and a temperature. We want to know how many moles of that gas are present. So we're going to take our well, I'm not sure why that doing that. Okay. And so pause the video now, see what you can do. Hopefully you got 0 0.013 moles of the gas. Uh, we've talked about standard temperature and pressure. So actually I'm not gonna get into that. Here we have a good, another sample question, another example question. So pause the video now, try to answer this question about a tennis ball. Hopefully you got two ATM. So a question you might be asking yourselves, and we're gonna stop here after I mention this point. The question that you might be asking yourself is, well, how do I know when to use those other gas laws that he talked about? And how do I know when to use the ideal gas law? The answer, and I'll just, there we go, is that the other gas laws, the Boyle's law, Charles's law, the gay lussac law, the combined gas law, you use any of those when you're comparing two different conditions, a sort of a before and after. And so you're saying that, that maybe you have this balloon, this five liter balloon at 20 degrees C, what is the volume of the balloon if I change the temperature to 100 degrees C? So I have these two different sets of conditions that I'm comparing versus the ideal gas law is one point in time. In the ideal gas law, we, we take that same balloon 
and we'd say I have a five liter balloon. It's at 23 degrees C. It has a pressure of 1.2 ATMs. What is the number of moles? And so it's one point in time. And so that's where you would use the two differently. And so that's it for today. That's lots of stuff thrown at you, lots of gas laws and lots of different types of calculations. Practice them. There's lots of practice with the gas laws on the website. Practice them and get good at recognizing when to use which one. Next time, we'll talk about some other applications of these and talk about how we use some of the gas laws in various chemical reaction scenarios. So that's it for today. Everybody have a great day.